Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome here to the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. We are a green political foundation and we are very happy that so many people showed up in presence, although the weather is quite uh, uncomfortable for many and that's also uh, mainly, I think, the reason why there are so many people in the digital sphere following us uh, here with the event tonight. So um, a warm welcome to everyone here, but also uh, in the live stream. The occasion of today's uh, event is still, it's this year, the anniversary of the European single market. So uh, it's a moment to take stock, to look back, uh, but in particular, of course, also to look forward. What are we going to see in the future? The single market is not a means in itself, it is a promise of European integration and cooperation. It is also a power factor. As Michel Barnier just recently said, the only reason that Mr. Biden and the Chinese president respect us is the single market. The single market is also part of the Brussels effect. So rules that we set can have resonance in the world, and I know that quite, uh, quite good by the example of the GDPR, which we were setting as a standard for data protection only with the power of the single market in the European Union. And it's not just uh, economically beneficial. The EU single market at the very core of is also at the very core of environmental standards, of consumer protection, and also of social ambitions in Europe. And I'd like to highlight that element in particular because it is obvious that the participation and the wealth of this single market and the question also of social standards and security is something which we have to reinforce when looking at the single market. In order to achieve that, we have structured the event here in two parts to uh, inform each other and discuss, uh, discuss with, each other, with each other first by a keynote and then by a debate. And for the keynote, we are really thrilled and happy to welcome someone who has been commissioned by the European Council to draft a report on the future of the single market he currently serves as the president of the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris, and previously he was dean of the Paris School of International Affairs, and previously before that he was prime minister of Italy, and before serving as Italy's minister for European Affairs and minister of industry. So the best person we could imagine for this evening to look back but also to look forward on the history of the single market. Enrico Letter, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. I would like, first of all, to thank you all for the invitation, and uh, I would like to thank uh, first of all, Anna Cavazzini, for the fantastic work we are doing together, if I may say. Anna, as president of the uh, committee at the European Parliament, is leading the discussion of the European Parliament, and the European Parliament is playing a, a crucial and fundamental role in this part of the debate on the future of the single market. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And of course, I'm looking forward to discuss with debate with long-time friend Francisca Brandner and Anna Cavazzini. And thank you really for what the foundation for the Stiftung is uh, aimed to do on this topic. Uh, because we are just at the beginning of a process. March will be the month in which my report is supposed to be presented at the European Council. And then I hope this report can uh, uh, inaugurate a debate, a discussion that will uh, have the elections, the European elections, as the main moment, and then uh, the next legislature and the next European Commission. I would like to start by saying that uh, the uh, single market was launched by Jacques Delors. Jacques Delors, in uh, the 80s, launched this process, this exercise, and then he said, I'm aware it's impossible to fall in love with the single market. 
And I start from this definition by Jacques Delors by saying that I, as president of the Jacques Delors Institute, I always say that Jacques Delors is always right. But this definition, because my generation, the generation of those who became adults when the uh, Berlin Wall uh, fault uh, was at the very center of our history, we, at the end of the day, we were falling in love with the freedom that the Berlin Wall fall uh, uh, created in all Europe. And at the end of the day, the single market, at the very beginning, wasn't a technical matters. It was a very hard matter, because it was freedom, liberty, freedom of movement, freedom of eliminating borders, freedom to move, freedom to exchange, freedom to learn. I have to say that the single market became later on a technical, maybe too technical, field and matter. This is why I think, and if I may say, that would be my first point and my uh, maybe most important uh, uh, point, I strongly believe that we can have a successful European Union only if we take the true value at the core of the single market and we relaunch it, but not in technical terms, in hard terms, if I may say. Uh, I think we are in the right moment to do so for many reasons. First of all, because if I have to find one, uh, I would say, um, summary of what I uh, did until uh, uh, today and in the last three months, going around Europe, meeting all stakeholders, government, European Parliament, Court of Justice, debates, universities, people, students. I had the feeling that uh, we are in a period in which there's a sort of single market fatigue. And I will start from here uh, by saying that why this fatigue, which are the reasons uh, what we can do to try to overcome this fatigue. First of all, fatigue. Uh, why fatigue? Because we had the feeling that uh, what was needed for the single market, we did it. And today, uh, what is necessary to complete it is not in our hands uh, for many reasons, because it is complicated, because fragmentation is there, uh, because there are other priorities, and because there's uh, difficulty in mobilizing energies uh, to uh, go in the direction of a more completed single market. Single market today is a more fragmented uh, framework than yesterday. I can give you a lot of examples on that. Single market today is very fragmented, first of all because of the change at world level, and also because uh, of the fact that the single market reached a level where it is necessary not to go by inertia, but to have a strong political will to overcome obstacles and to break obstacles. And I don't see today this political will. I see today many difficulties. Uh, I see today uh, many countries thinking that, for instance, the enforcement of common regulations can be in the hands of a single country with the idea to slow down this enforcement uh, because of national interests and not having a common uh, uh, framework or a common uh, level playing field to, be, uh, to build together the common rules. I start by saying that uh, all these difficulties are today on uh, uh, the scene but these difficulties can find a solution. Which is the solution uh, I have in mind, or the two solutions I would like to uh, put at the center of the scene and also at the center of this debate today? Uh, 
uh, we need to find a boost for the future of the single market. Uh, without a boost, the single market uh, will uh, have uh, many problems in the future. It would be very complicated uh, to have a successful future of the European uh, integration. And I see the two boosts uh, uh, in, first, the green transition, second, uh, the European security. I say the green transition and the European security, and I'll try immediately to develop why I think so. First of all, the green transition. We are at the end of a legislature where the Green Deal was the very center of a legislature where finally we had one big thematic choice that was at the center of the political debate. I don't remember other legislatures where we had such a centrality for a topic. And we had this centrality and I think it was great, it was well realized, but we, I think, maybe overpromised. Or when I say we, I would like to say we had some uh, approach in terms of overpromising. And today, the big discussion we are having is about the future of the Green Deal and the Green Transition. Because we know very well that there's debate in many countries, and the debate is about the way in which we can continue on the green transition or not. Uh, la pause réglementaire, some countries are launching this idea. Other countries are saying that uh, maybe it's too fast and we have to slow down. Uh, and uh, fossil is uh, increasing in the world. While we are th saying that maybe we have to slow down, at the same time, uh, fossil is uh, increasing. What I think uh, is necessary to do today is to find a way to link the future of the single market and the green transition. And this is one of the topics we discussed in the, dis in the debate we had in the European Parliament, but in my going around Europe, discussing in the different capitals with stakeholders, with citizens, students, I am more and more convinced that this point is the crucial point. How to get this link, how to bridge the future of the single market and the green transition. Why I say that? Because it's the only way to get successful the green transition. And I would like to be very clear on that. I'm a great fan of Next Generation EU. I'm a great fan of the inv public investment leg that we had and we decided to have in the European Union. But I know very well that it will be very difficult to have a Next Generation EU too. And uh, we have to be aware of that because the conditions in which we uh, uh, created Next Generation EU so the big investment funds that we had all together in 2020 were incredibly unique conditions because of COVID, uh, because of coronavirus, because of the recession after coronavirus. And we had this enormous investment, 500 billion euros uh, concretely invested on the twin transition. And in all the European countries, with success and for a long period of years. I can tell you that one of the statements I heard in my going around Europe is once in a lifetime. This is the reaction of some countries to next generation EU. And if I'm not wrong, but I leave it to you, it is also something that is uh, echoing in the political debate in Germany. Once in a lifetime. With the idea that after next generation EU one, we come back to the usual way to build up the budget at the European level, leaving each country alone with his choices. I think it would be uh, a disaster for the European Union of the future and also for the green transition. This is why 
we have to create the conditions to have a second investment leg with public money. The only way to have it is to have private money focused on the green transition. And the only way to have private money focused on the green transition is to create, complete, build up the capital markets union around the completion of the single market. And the only way to do so is to be very much focused in the way in which finally we can create this capital markets union. Capital markets union is not something that you can fall in love with. It's very complicated. But at the same time, without a cap a, an effective capital markets union, it's impossible to have the enough, uh, I would say, uh, effective uh, capacity, financial capacity, from the private side uh, for uh, the uh, investment in the uh, green transition. I say that for a very simple reason. The European markets are so weak in comparison with the American market. We are all aware that each year, 2% of the European GDP is the people savings that are leaving Europe to go to the US, to go to the US to finance the American economy. And to finance the American economy, for instance, for the uh, IRA or for other uh, initiatives, and uh, we know very well that we have to create the conditions to have this 2% of GDP staying in Europe and creating the conditions to be able to focus this big amount of money towards the green transition. We need to create a ve vehicle that uh, uh, is absolutely necessary and is the only way uh, to uh, have the possibility to, to use this part of uh, uh, the savings of the European people. Um, and why I say that? Because I see that as the only condition to convince frugals, governments coming uh, from uh, the Nordic countries or other countries, even the public debate in Germany, to match private and public money for the future of the green transition. If we are able to do so, the green transition can be for the next decade uh, a, a reality. Otherwise, the green transition at the European level will be only a public debate where each country will say, I'll do with my own money. And uh, we know very well that one of the main fragmented discussions of the fragmentation at the European level is the discussion about state aids. Uh, state aids means very uh, simply the fact that uh, uh, if you don't have a common fiscal capacity, a common leg, at the end of the day, you leave it uh, to each country alone. But it can, each country alone means very clearly that small countries, they don't have money to do so. Countries with a high debt, they can't. So you leave it only to very few countries, of course, a big country like Germany, but other very small countries. That means that you will fragment the system and it will be impossible to have an effective uh, and successful green transition. This is why my first big point is that if we want the green transition, we need to have the completion of the single market. We need to have an integrated single market for a very simple reason. What is the single market? It's the four freedoms. Freedom of movement of goods, services, people, and capitals. And we know very well that there's today an asymmetric implementation of the single market. For goods, it works. For people, it works not perfectly, but I have to say it works. For services, it works not so good. For capitals, it's a disaster. Everything is in the US. The capital market in Europe it doesn't exist, and we are not able to use it uh, as we uh, wish. This is why the core of the discussion, in my view,
has to be how to link the future of the single market in the part that is the least integrated to the green transition. The link between the two is complicated, it is not easy, but in my view is the core discussion we have uh, to uh, deal with. Because if we are able to do so, I underline once again the possibility to have for the future a great investment, both private money and public money. We know very well that without money it will be complicated. It will be very complicated for all the social issues, for all the uh, investment issues that are necessary. Um, and we know very well that this money, we have to uh, have this money all together, as we did for uh, Next Generation EU. My second point is about security. Why I say security? Uh, for a very simple reason. We were in the European Union when the single market started in a world in which we thought that the rest of the world was ready to take our rule of law, our system of values. 30 years ago, it was exactly the spirit, the mood. We created the system at that time in which, for us, Europeans, it was not so problematic to take technology from China, to take gas from Russia, to take oil from the Arab world, and to be, how we say, protected by the Americans for our security. That was exactly the system that we created. And there are countries like Germany and Italy, absolutely twins in that, absolutely twins. Suddenly, some years ago, we understood that this peaceful world that uh, we were uh, creating wasn't so peaceful. I once I used a term uh, uh, that in, in France is very, is very performing. Uh, un monde de brut, uh, a word of brutality that was around us. And we thought 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that we were entering uh, a period, a world, where it would have been completely different because democracy, because rule of law, because uh, human rights, and so on and so forth. And also in terms of, uh, of course, of green transition and green deal. Then suddenly, in the last years, we understood that the situation is completely different. We understood, first of all, of course, because of the war, because of Russian aggression to Ukraine. I am among those who were shocked by what happened, because I have always in mind the images. By chance, I was representing my country in the two last multilateral events where Putin was one of us, if I may say. The G7 was G8 at that, uh, at that time. And the last G8 took place uh, in 2013 with Putin there. I was there. I can tell you, for me, it's a shock to think what is happening today. And I remember the, the, the G20 hosted by Putin in St. Petersburg in the same year. Uh, he was there like one of us, if I may say, if I may use this term. And today we are in a completely different world, with the idea to come back to the, how we say, the worst uh, 20th century, with tanks solving the problems, changing borders, and with the idea that um, the Yalta approach is the most powerful one. In my country, I took a position on that, uh, that is the position of, uh, uh, of freedom, of values, of uh, rule of law, saying that in my country we had a strong discussion on the war. Many people saying that, but 
we promised Putin that Ukraine was in his sphere of influence, so uh, we are provocating uh, Putin. And I can't agree on this position for a very simple reason, because the Yalta approach is for the last centuries, not for today. Today there's the freedom uh, of one people to say where they want to live. And it is to them to choose. It's not to us. It's not to a table with leaders to decide where Ukraine has to be. And the freedom of people are today uh, part of this complicated debate. And I link it to the single market for a very simple reason, because the future of the European Union is a future that is related to the word security. And if I may say, security means many things. Uh, security means energy security. Security means being uh, able to be independent, independent on technology. But to be independent on technology and security, we need uh, to uh, put together, to put together tools, objectives, money, on research, on innovation, on industry, on telecommunications. On telecommunications, I, uh, we are in, a, in this, in my view, crazy situation in which, in uh, at the world level, on telecommunication, uh, the the. Average client number of client of uh, telecommunication company in China is 400 million. Uh, in the US is 100 million, and in Europe is five million. And it's of course one company with such a small uh, level of uh, uh, such a small dimension. It's very complicated to think that the dimension doesn't matter in terms of uh, building of in connectivity, innovation, future research, and so on. Security means uh, also the security in terms of social sustainability. I would like to add another point that is, in my view, crucial for the future of the single market. Um, I just mentioned the fact that for workers, for people, mobility today is a um, possibility. But I would like to add one point that is, in my reflection, I'm, sharing, I'm, I'm using this opportunity to share with you some reflection. I don't want to spoil the uh, conclusions of the report. I would like just to share with you some reflections and to have your reactions on that. The single market is freedom to move, first of all. It's freedom of mobility, of goods, people, services, capitals. But I think one of the main problems in the European political debate today is the fact that there's a large part of our populations that are accusing us, you are those who wants a Europe, elite Europe, only for those who want to move, who want to be in a mobile mood. Those who want to speak another language, want to live in another country, want to uh, have a job in another country. But there's a large part of our people they don't want the freedom to move. They want the freedom to stay. And I think uh, it seems a contradiction with the single market. But I think we have to complete the single market with the freedom to stay, if I may say. If we are not able to complete the single market with the freedom to stay, I think we will leave to the populists, to the far right, an asset that is uh, I think, too much effective for them. Because there's a large part of our people, they want to be European, but they want the European Union protecting them, and protecting them, I, if I may say, the, in, in the good way. And it is what uh, I think we have to think a little bit about it. When I say 
freedom to stay, I say freedom to stay in a place where you can live in decent way, with services, infrastructures, with green transition, with the possibility uh, to be there in a uh, decent environment, and so on and so forth. And uh, maybe I am a little bit, I would say, in an autocritical way. We never had a specific focus on that. We always had the feeling to uh, continue to relaunch in terms of mobility, mobility, mobility. Yes, I am the most mobile pe person in uh, Europe, I think. Uh, uh, Monday I was in Luxembourg, Tuesday I was in Berlin, um, yesterday I was, uh, Tuesday I was in Brussels, yesterday I was in Berlin, tomorrow I will be in Stockholm, so uh, I love mobility, but I know very well that there's a lot of people, they don't want mobility and they want to be uh, free to stay and we have to help them to be free to stay in a, a decent way. And I would like to underline the importance of this uh, topic and to add to this topic another big mission that I have in mind. That is the mission of the fact that when Jacques Delors invented the single market, he invented the single market of four freedoms. Goods, services, capitals and persons. But in reality, this definition in four categories is a little bit, in my view, not uh, enough for what is happening today. There's something that is a fifth freedom that we have maybe to think about it. And I relaunch to Anna this point because I'm sure that the discussions that we can have in the next weeks can be interesting on that, and even the discussion today can be interesting. There's a fifth liberty, a fifth freedom. At the end of the day, I think the best term to frame it is, the, is knowledge, with all the different aspects that are aspect related to knowledge, to skills, to the way in which innovation can uh, move. And the fact that we need to have a single market, so the freedom to move, but also the possibility for uh, knowledge, for innovation, to become the real boost for the future of the European uh, integration. If we are not able to do so, we continue to think with uh, glasses of the past. And I think this idea to uh, have a look to the future, of course, that brings also the discussion on uh, artificial intelligence, on the rules for technology, on many other aspects. And for me, it is so crucial and so important also for another reason, and I would like to, to end up with my final uh, point, that is, if what I said until now is true, I think we have uh, a final mission, and I have a final mission that I would like to put at the very center of the debate. And this final issue is the fact that sometime when I have this discussion on the future of Europe, the world, US, Asia, I have also some, someone saying that, but uh, in reality we were the masters of the world with Europeans in the past. Now we don't want to be the masters of the world. We want to live in a decent way without any will to dominate the world with our rules. I listen to this uh, point and I think that we can't accept this point for a very simple reason. Because the world of today is a totally interdependent world in which even if we don't want to dominate the others and uh, no idea to dominate anyone, we need to sit at the table where the rules are written because these rules will have a role for us for a very simple reason. 
technology means today places where these rules are written and where we need to be at this table. We were at this table and we are no more at this table. Just a simple example, GSM was a European technology, 5G is not an European technology. And uh, we have each of us one mobile or maybe two mobiles in our pockets. And 20 years ago, part of this room would have been with a Nokia, probably. Or and today we are all with mobiles that are not European mobiles. You can say, but it's not a problem. It's like a, a TV or like... A, in reality, it is more than that, uh, because our mobile is our second identity. We know very well that the mobile is full of our identity, all the data are our second identity. And who is the owner of this data? Wins. And who is the true owner of data? There are three philosophies in the world, in the world on that. In the US, on this topic, at the end of the day, is the market who wins. Is the market the winner? They don't want rules. They blame us because we put too many rules. And at the same time, the only way is the reputation of a company in the market. Uh, but the true owner is the market. In China, the true owner is the state, and the true owner of data at the end of the day is the state. And we have so many examples on that. I think we have to be proud of the fact that for us, we, the Europeans, we think that is the person, the true owner at the end of the day. And this ownership means something very crucial in terms of rules, and also the fact that on these rules we have to fight. And I think we have to fight on that. It is, I just mentioned, the, I would say, the very old topic of data protection for our mobile, but uh, today there are so many topics that are related to that. And at the end of the day, we need to be more united. A single market, a single digital market, means the capacity of our European companies to be stronger at world level. It's the capacity for all of us to be stronger, united, and so to sit at this table. That is the crucial point. You know very well that this statement that the, uh, the European countries are divided in two groups of countries. The small countries, first group. The countries that they are not anymore aware that they are small. But in reality, this is the division of the European countries. And we know very well that we are all small countries at world level. The only way to sit at this table is to be together, to be united. And this is why I end up here by saying that I'm so pleased because of this uh, opportunity. But also for another very simple reason, because I wanted, since the beginning and since my first meeting with Anna in Brussels, I wanted to use this exercise of the mandate to write a report on the future of the single market as a collective exercise. I'm here as a tool. You have to consider me as a tool, as a voice, as a voice for a collective exercise. That was not the case usually for the so-called high-level report at the European level. I'm here not because I have theories, ideas, I don't want to, to write a book on that. I'm here because I think we need, in this very moment, to relaunch uh, the European integration. And we can relaunch it through the relaunch of the future of the future of the single market with these ideas. But I want to do so together in a collective exercise. This is why I'm, 
I'm going around, I'm listening, I'm discussing, I'm trying to also to receive ideas, proposals. I'm really very open to new ideas and to new proposals. And let me say that I'm sure that at the end of this meeting we will have a lot of new ideas for the future of the single market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Letta, for your uh, very insightful uh, perspectives and, and thoughts uh, on the future also of the single market. I would like to invite the two other experts you were already referring to to, uh, to us here. So a very warm, warm welcome to um, Franziska Brandner, who is uh, the first, uh, uh, who is the member of the German Bundestag and Parliamentary State Secretary in the German Federal Ministry for Economy, uh, uh, Economic Affairs and Climate Action. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and also she served in the European Parliament from 2009 to 2013, where Anna Cavazzini is also a member. And uh, she is also very warm welcomed here in our round, so please also come up. And um, she is member of the European Parliament uh, since uh, 2019, and since two, uh, November 2020, she has also been the chair of the uh, single market, the internal market and consumer protection committee in the European Parliament. And uh, she's also a substitute member in the Committee for International Trade and vice chair of the Brazil, Brazil EP Brazil delegation. So thank you for being with us. And uh, I would say we should uh, right start, as there have been a lot of thoughts uh, by Enrico Letcher's um, keynote. And maybe starting with... Uh, uh, shortly for a moment just looking back because you were uh, already lining out a lot of very important steps forward talking about an integrated single market also the question of the capital union uh, to be put up and uh, many questions we should refer to but looking back on the 30 years of the single market in place um, maybe uh, also to all of you, and maybe starting with uh, Francisca. Um, looking back, what do you think are the greatest benefits of the single market? And do you think that in Germany and in Europe as whole, well, we have uh, taken account of these benefits? Uh, because obviously that's a very big precondition for walking ahead with the proposals on the table. Yes, yeah, thank you, um, and it's a pleasure being with you here, uh, Enrico. It's um, it's great to know that you have this task, if I may say so. Um, it's in good hands. Um, looking back, and I'm also a big fan, by the way, of Jacques Delors, and that he's not known enough in Europe for what he has accomplished for the European Union, um, because he has allowed us to live in a place, and you were making distinctions in terms of freedom of movement, but it's also, of course, it has provided us as consumers a lot of safety. I'm like none of us is uh, doubting and going into a supermarket and being afraid of uh, uh, eating something that is, you know, not healthy or you know many of these things. When you go into other countries, you you're not so sure, um, and if you travel across the EU, you can be quite sure. Uh, so it's a lot of also about uh, the security that has been provided via the internal market. Uh, the variety we have, I remember growing up, we had less variety in the supermarket um, than we have today. And it was, you know, special to eat uh, some Greek food. And today it's uh, very, you know, usual. So I think that variety that you have at home without traveling <laughs> is also part of what we have been able to achieve within the EU. So for me, it's a, it's a freedom, but it's also security that has been uh, brought by the internal market. But of course, also difficulties because of the openness we have. And I think that we have to be addressing these difficulties as well in terms of the taxation issues, you know, where do the products go, et cetera. So I think mainly it has been a bless and a blessing and, um, and often it's not 
judged correctly and we just see the burdens and we don't even uh, see the beauty. And I remember at the time I was in the European Parliament, everybody was debating the light bulbs. It was a huge debate um, and how terrible and you know the light would go off and and today I'm like, who cares? You know, and th I remember then there was the debate about the shower bulbs. It was exactly the same. And then the olive cans. You know, you always have these uh, sp debates that stick out that are crazy. Um, and that afterwards, everybody's sort of lucky that somebody had the honor, like the courage to do it. And I think often, and I see this also being part of uh, government side now, that often you do agree what is needed, but nobody has the courage to do it. And then it's sort of, can't the commission propose it? Um, and I think for 30 years, the commission has been in a, you know, in a courage or situation to often propose what everybody knows makes sense, like having light that saves a lot of energy. Um, probably we could have done it when sometimes in a smarter way, but I think that was also a role that Jack Delors started to play and that sometimes, you know, um, it has also been helpful, not always in a, implemented in the best way, but that role has been part of the internal market as well. Many people also like criticized over the years that the single market is only like pro business and only for business to be beneficial for economic actors, but not for citizens or consumers. Uh, how do you react to that? Also, looking back at the last years and decades of the single market, Anna. Yeah. First of all, thanks for inviting us today. I think it's really, really so important that we lead this debate not only in, in Brussels, not only in the European Parliament, but that we also go in the countries and different member states and the capitals to see what is really the input um, that you can take with in your very important reports. I'm also happy that you that you came. Um, indeed, your question leads to a very interesting fact. I, I When I look back um, and when I started as like a young student to be active in the Green Movement, I think a little bit together with you guys, I have to say, um, we had, <laughs> it's a long time ago, <laughs> we had a more critical approach towards the internal market. And it's, it's especially because of that. I remember, you know, when I started all this debate about Europe, it was like, okay, the internal market rules, they're enshrined in the treaty. So they're like kind of constitutional law. And it's basically freedom for businesses to export all over Europe. Um, and, you know, if um, this kind of freedom for a business overrules our social policy, then, yeah, it's like it is. You know, for example, um, social housing in the Netherlands was basically stopped by the commission because of the single market rules. So the Greens started, I would say, in a more skeptical um, approach towards the single market because the internal market rules can be so powerful, because they are so powerful. But I think what happened in the last year is that we turned them around. You know, we made the internal market rules more social and more green and more digital and more consumer friendly. And, um, and, and that is why also now in the more like greener debate, greener family debate, we have a much more um, positive approach. And I think I can say now that we are using the internal market rules as a tool for the green transition, as a tool for the digital transition. I think that is, that is quite a step forward. Francisca, you want to just jump no, in there? I'm a bit of a, a bit tiny bit older generation, and for me, <laughs> <laughs> tiny bit, very tiny bit. And for me, it is quite interesting to see how the green position has been changing on the European question. Because uh, Petra Kelly, who started it, she was a, a fonctionnaire européen. She was a hard hold convicted European fighting for the European dream and project. So if you look at her uh, her speeches. Um, She had to go, but she was, um, you know, she was hired. Uh, she was working in Brussels for the institutions, um, which many don't know when they hear about Petra Kelly. And I went back to read some of her speeches, which are so heartfully pro-European and you know integration and freedom and all of this. Um, and it's quite interesting to see then how this turned into more uh, critical view, and then how it swings back. So I just want to say, for me, the, the first, uh, you know. The very pro-European commitment of Petra Kelly was for me an inspiration to join the Greens, um, even though afterwards it became a, a bit more critical. 
not only with uh, the uh, green approach to the single market, but also to the uh, question of the approach of the member states to the single market. It was not always a love affair, Enrico Letter. There were uh, phases where the, the single wa market was embraced and also the uh, new chances of the uh, single uh, market, especially with regards to uh, getting workers everywhere and getting uh, companies, of course, a bigger market uh, was welcomed. But there were also interventions into the single market by member states, by also even uh, restricting, for example, no border controls again. Uh, we, we also have different uh, phases of that. How do you see these la last 30 years uh, developing and and do you think that member states also learned from it and understood uh, how harmful they could act also towards the single market? In reality, I think the, the big difference is related to the world around us. The true difference is that when the single market started, we were the center of the world. China wasn't there, India wasn't there. The rest of the world was not there. Now we know very well what is the situation around us, and we know very well that we are united or we are in the corner, uh, every one of us in, in, in the corner. So my point is that single market today is a great opportunity to be able to understand that uh, what before was only an inward-looking approach, inward-looking with the idea that uh, we need competition among us, we need to cut uh, uh, monopolies and so on and so forth. Today, maybe we have to think in a different way. This is why I, I think all the discussion about open strategic autonomy is a good dis discussion if we are able to have an open strategic autonomy without the idea to come back to old industrial policies, killing the four freedoms. We need to, I would say, to save and rescue the four freedoms, but at the same time to relaunch the idea to uh, be together in many fields where it is necessary to be together. And if we are not together, uh, the scale, the dimension won't be there. I. I want to be very clear on that. I'm not in favor of becoming all giants because the Americans are giants. Being giants is, is not per se something of uh, positive. But the European Union is always a mix between small and big. Everywhere, member states, companies, everywhere, it's a mix between small and big. The big problem is that the small of yesterday is the small of today and will be the same small of tomorrow. It's the big of yesterday that is different from the big of today and the big of tomorrow. Because the big of today needs to be a little bit bigger than the big of yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before the telco example. I can tell you about... Uh, other, uh, many other examples, but if you are not able to do so, the big of today in the US and in China will dominate us on many other fields. This is why I think there's a necessity to be together with this strategic uh, autonomy in, in mind. And you mentioned that like it, it is a new kind of union which has to be built. So it's not the traditional old like coal and steel union. So there we come to a point of which are the building blocks in the end of this new union. You were mentioning the capital market, which is important for uh, getting um, uh, investments done and, and uh, also specific innovation uh, is still done. Uh, but there's also the question of which is the right model, the model of being also maybe the ones who are setting standards on certain fields, like we're talking about raw materials and how we act to that. Uh, Francisca, where do you see the most important buildings, bl building blocks we need to build now in order to have this modern kind of union based on the single market? I would certainly agree on the capital market union. I mean, it's not a new issue, huh? It's been <laughs> there for many, many years. 
And if you break it down to insolvency laws, etc., it becomes quite complicated. But I think we need to tackle it. I very much agree that this should be one of the number one priorities of the next commission, seriously, to, to come forward with a, a clear proposals for the capital market union. But if I may say, I think that we don't need to build so many new building blocks, but we need to make those we have faster, easier, um, and really serve the purposes. And if I may... Uh, and you said, you know, the green transformation, you said security. I agree. Uh, we need to also digital and di saving democracy. Um, and that needs to be the, you know, the four sort of objectives. Um, I would always add uh, keeping democracy at home. You, you touched on it in, at the end when you said the freedom to stay. Um, but I really think we need to make sure that we keep that in a perspective on how we use our internal market and the rules to save the foundations for our democracy. That is in the digital space, but it's in anti-corruption and many of these areas where we really also need to make sure that the single market is helping us. Um, when I say, uh, you know, faster, easier, the past we have been using lots of directives instead of uh, regulations because it's been easier to find solutions, compromises. Um, and if you find a compromise at the European level, it's sort of a, a bit of a m mixed agreement. And then everybody goes home and implements it how they had thought to do it anyhow. And you end up with, a, instead of having one EU harmonized outcome, you end up with worse a situation than before. Uh, and if you come to a federal state like Germany, you add 16 states and then the entire benefit of the internal market is gone or it has become extremely difficult. So I really think it's been in the part a bit of a laziness and we could afford that laziness because the pressure from outside was not so strong. But I think we really now have to do the conceptual work and the hard, you know, difficult debates on finding real joint standards. Um, I think on freedom of movement, we need to work much harder on recognizing jobs and qualifications and we need to make it easier for people to really move in um, and take away all the bureaucracy we have added uh, in many of these areas. Uh, and we need to protect our level playing field much better. We have good product standards, but the customs checks are not strong enough. I think we need to get better there to really make sure the standards we set are actually fulfilled and implemented. Um, and if I may say so, on the protection side, the U.S. has been advancing the entire topic of greenfield investments, um, etc. We need to get better there. We see that the, the competitors of us, um, they try to get our knowledge out by making very, very interesting offers to people working in these companies. Luckily, many of our people are not so interested to move tomorrow to Shanghai or to somewhere because they know it's, in a way it's actually not too bad to live in Germany or in France or Italy. So what we see now happening is that many of these companies then move to Germany, open up an office and just hire those people here. And after two, three years, they have acquired all their knowledge. They shut their office down. They take their knowledge back home. Um, and we're still so... I, we have no rules on this. We have no tools to do whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And we need to take that serious, that the knowledge we have with our people is key to be protected if you want to keep that up. So this is about setting up new investment rules, um, greenfield, what do we do with people? I mean, like, we don't have to go the entire US way that you lose your citizenship um, if you give your knowledge away. Um, you know, I'm not there, but at least we have to start thinking about it and finding ways. So there are lots of, um, and you've talked about state aid. Seriously, I think that will be your number one priority to tackle. It's no longer between a French and German company. It's if we are there anyhow. And it's if I get from my state, Baden-Württemberg, you know, we are in a transformation. We really need European acceptance of state aid in these regions. And we only get it if we work together with Romania, which is lovely, um, but sometimes just not realistic. And if in the end we end up with nothing because we have these, uh, if I may say so, to the border of silly state aid rules in a world of geopolitical competition, then we're not strengthening the internal market, we're terribly weakening it. So I think all of this is you know, really up for the next commission to strengthen our internal market. 
Certainly one of the big uh, questions to be solved and somehow somehow also an ambivalence always between uh, getting these things done, but in the end also having to get it done on the European level somehow together and not ending up in uh, some single ways of the, of the member states. Uh, Anna, you have been uh, thoroughly with your committee working day by day in getting these deals done in the European Parliament together with the Council uh, and fixed our charging cables, I have to tell again, uh, and, uh, and all the other stuff uh, uh, for consumers mainly, uh, which is visible um, and, and where people really see the benefit in the end of regulatory power. But of course, this is the needy greedy technical standards. Will we be able to get in the like, treaty framework which we have to further solutions with the member states on, on further harmonization uh, in the single market? Yeah, um, this is an excellent question. Also the question, what does further harmonization exactly mean? And there it really depends so much to whom you talk. Um, if I talk to um, the business community and they want to talk a lot to me and I try to meet them always, um, but their main point is always, okay, the single market is too fragmented. There's too many national hurdles, administrative burdens. Um, so we cannot really be 100% active in the single market. If you look a little bit at the European Commission last single market report, they say, okay, in goods we are okay, but in services we are quite bad. But if you look at why it is so difficult to offer a service in another EU country, it is also because of very simple reasons like language, for example, things you cannot just, you know, with magic uh, make it disappear. And there, of course, the US market still has has it an advantage. I read even like comparative studies. I don't know if they were from the Jacques Delors Institute or from some other institute that even the EU single market is more integrated than the US market. I mean, it probably depends a little bit on which, which indicators you take, but that there is scholars who say, wow, we are not so far off or even better than the US market. But then, yeah, you still have different languages. You'd still def have different education systems or whatsoever. So there's things you may never overcome. So for me, um, personally, I also think when it comes to, we have to define better what means more harmonization and better harmonization. Um, and I think there's a lot of, um, you know, people talk not to each other, but really more across each other. I don't know. Um, but if you talk about the bigger political problems um, and not so much the only nitty gritty harmonization, um, I would also say that this whole idea of embedding our values more in the internal market rules, this is really the, the new challenge for me. Yeah, speaking about the green transition, I mentioned it already, but saying, okay, it's not only about, you know, abolishing barriers between the different EU countries, it's about which kind of positive rules do we want to set so that we can foster the green transition. And I think this, this is basically also a big, big, big um, question when we talk about what does harmonization or completion of the single market means at the end. One of the things, uh, Enrico Letta, you were referring to, the Next Generation EU Fund as a central factor uh, also uh, with regards to ramping up some investments in some, some areas uh, when with regard to the transformation. And uh, also Francisca was referring to the state aid rules. Uh, so coming back to that, do you think that there would be any chance uh, when this would be part of your recommendations that in the European Council member states would agree on that fully or are we here in a situation where we need to further debate also openly about next step of this union or new unions to be adopted by um, uh, enhanced cooperation of certain member states and um, uh, do you already think about this or do you don't you want to think about it, but just uh, want the whole union to move forward? How do you approach this question? Uh, I'm very frank. I think that we need solutions. And uh, to have solutions, sometimes it's necessary to be in a small group of people and to go. And then the rest will follow. I can't imagine we can continue on some issues to wait for the last uh, veto. Uh, there are many topics, it's not the 
today's topic, but uh, there's a topic that for me it's very important. Ten years ago, uh, in Lampedusa, we had the first big disaster in terms of uh, uh, what is happening in the Mediterranean. And after 10 years, I can tell you that uh, altogether at 27, in my view, it is impossible to get on that solutions. So I, frankly speaking, I think it is the best example to say sometimes enhanced cooperations can be the right solution. Because it is also the way to <laughs> avoid alibis, also for big countries. Because we know, oh, sorry, we can't because the Hungarians, many times. Eh? We can't because the Polish, uh, or no, we can. We want, we can, we do. And uh, I think there's a big responsibility of the big countries. If the big countries, they move, I think with the, mo the move with yeah, determination, with the focus, with solutions. Uh, and um, sorry if I, uh, I mentioned the topic of migration, but <laughs> if we continue like that, uh, we will have uh, the far right exploding. And I say that for a very simple reason, because we continue with the idea or to overpromising or to uh, avoiding uh, managing the topic and uh, closing eyes. And it's, uh, it's not working. So it's, uh, it's the typical example where it's absolutely necessary to take our own responsibilities. And if it is necessary to go uh, in different speeds, Europe is today is a, is a different speed, Europe. Euro is a different speed. Schengen is a different speed. There are many different speeds. So it depends on the way in which you want to solve the problems. You know, I'm quite proud because a couple of years ago, the position of my party was still that we're against different speeds. And I remember losing those on my party convention, um, making the demand that we should be in favor of a few moving ahead. And I lost. You know, it happens sometimes. But in the end, uh, it's now our party <laughs> position. <laughs> but I'm wholeheartedly convinced that this is exactly the right approach. No, we, we, we just... <laughs> Now we just need uh, maybe also uh, uh, the necessary leadership by some governments uh, uh, coming up. Um, and uh, just mentioning that, I think it's it's good to refer to uh, one publication which we as Heinrich Böll Foundation are doing every year, uh, a survey called Actually European. And in this year, key findings, you could find that the majority of Germans thinks that the advantage of the EU membership, so also of the, uh, of the single market, are greater than the disadvantage. And the majority of Germans is in favor of the EU uh, a fund for green uh, industry. So there is really key figures uh, where the benefits overweigh um, and, uh, and it shows that uh, people are also obviously ready for that. So the question is where to, where to start with these building blocks and also maybe an enhanced cooperation. Um, uh, but maybe coming to uh, back to the point of, of trust in that, uh, the citizens of Europe, of course, they have a lot of interest what they want to be delivered. And I think one of the problems is not only over, over promising, promising, but also under delivering. Um, and uh, so delivering uh, really solutions for, for their problems. And I think that one of the key questions is, what do we think that the single market reform could deliver for citizens? Uh, when it would be coming that uh, uh, the single market reform could be delivering in the upcoming years as a key message for citizens, as a promise, as somebody, as a vision uh, to look for. So I don't know who of you would like to start, but some ideas of where people really I was could, going uh, to take up at. the difficult challenge that Enrico and you posed in terms of how do we finance it, but I'm happy not to. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, he said that it's not very easy to explain a fiscal union, of course, and not no. something which would be promising. But maybe if I may say that, because I think the beauty of the NGO, um, the first rescue package was, of course, in a situation of crisis to help member states to overcome that moment. But the difficulty of it was that it was really national. 
um, there was no part of it that went to joint European projects. Uh, and I think that if we go into thinking again, then we really needed to be European. There was no funding for European infrastructure. There was no funding for joint indust industrial projects, etc. So I think really if we want to convince European citizens and taxpayers to go ahead, we have to solve the difficult questions we have in terms of modernizing our infrastructure and uh, making it a real European approach. I think there will be no way to have another round of European debt for national just expenditure. Um, so I think that really needs creative thinking and identification of projects, um, common approaches and strategies. And then I think the debate will be a different one. And isn't also one of the problems, Enrico Letter, that um, uh, the benefits are not really felt by smaller, medium-sized companies, for example. I mean, the bakery around the corner, they don't really benefit from next generation EU. At least I don't see them talking about that. So how do we address this? And, and uh, I think that the Inflation Reduction Act uh, somehow is, is showing us that it could be also differently because uh, uh, businesses could or might easier to receive, I, uh, I, I subscribe what Francisca just said, and I add another point. Uh, the single market is uh, beloved by big companies and is considered by a large part of SMEs as a threat. For a very simple reason, uh, an SME uh, usually works locally. And locally means that the single market can bring competition to uh, what you are doing locally. And for you, it's very complicated to go abroad for a very simple reason. Anna mentioned uh, language problems, but first of all, because of corporate law problems, for the legal framework problems, for the taxation problems. So I think, I am thinking uh, to put in the report, for instance, uh, how to have a common, a unique uh, legal framework for SMEs. How to have a common corporate law, for instance. To give the possibility to uh, go in Italy, to go in France, to go in Czech Republic, knowing that you don't need to have uh, 100 legal advisors. Uh, if you are an SME, you can't pay 100 legal advisors. I think that can be something interesting to change completely the discourse on that and saying what you just said before. Uh, what is for me the single market? And I think like that, it, it becoming something different from the past. Somehow I remember in the back of my mind that in, in the legal affairs committee in the European Parliament, the European, uh, what was it, uh, corporate law or something was already uh, in the debate very often, but very often it ends up like somewhere. Where does it end up, Anna, and how do we get <laughs> over that? It's very funny. This is also very internal, but uh, someone in the European Parliament tried to convince me to go next term into the Legal Affairs Committee to work on a common <laughs> corporate law, so we can, <laughs> we can, uh, I can implement what you're uh, what you're proposing. I'm thinking about it because I agree the analysis is true. There's no common corporate law, and there are some fractions of corporate law. For example, the new due diligence law, or you know, some other parts will be, of course, or the financial reporting uh, is, of course, also European law for all companies, but there's not really a common proper uh, company law, so I completely agree. I think it's a great uh, proposal. But coming back to your first question, um, I also made a survey in uh, Eastern Germany to see where, basically, if there's a difference between Eastern Germans and Western Germans vis-à-vis -vis the European Union. Um, two years ago or something. And what we found out um, was that especially in Eastern Germany, people wanted the EU to deliver with concrete solutions, exactly what you said. Um, and I think, yeah, the internal market legislation that we are doing has a really great benefit to show the people that the EU can deliver very concretely. I mean, you mentioned the common charter, but there's so many other um, uh, pieces of legislation that really directly end up with the people. And I really feel when I talk to people in Saxony where 
not everything is like very very easy often um when you're like pro-european or green or whatever um that this is something that people really like and i think when it comes to what can the people uh, expect from the from the single market reforms and last panel discussion we're on we also said the the people have to be in the center at the end i think um that yeah that don't have the feeling um everything is being liberalized and competition is everywhere but they that they're a little bit like protected and that um basically their life is concrete, concretely improving with the eu You almost answered my final question, oh. which I wanted to throw in, uh, uh, and maybe I just throw it and then pass on to Francisca the question really, because we will have also an upcoming campaign on the European elections. So the question comes up again and again, of course, how to get these in terms and words which people find interesting. Because obviously, as the Green Deal, the Next Generation Fund EU, we always search for the right buzzwords to attract people's uh, awareness for the necessity to have some European solutions. But somehow, it's very hard to find. So might be that in our final round, there are some ideas to be found. But Francisca, please come in. No. In terms of uh, freedom to stay and what is in there for citizens, I think it's a lot about good, future-proof jobs and that the single market contributes to keeping them at home. Um, and I think that will be key and I, I think that will be part of the yardstick. And the second part is that the single market outlaws practices that undermine our democracy. Uh, and that will be a second yardstick, I think. If the EU... You know, now with all the the fake or the lies we have on the social media, is the EU strong enough to go and fight with Meta and Elon Musk and all of these? Is the EU in that in that position to allow us to keep our democracies at home? So I think that will be two yardstick where everybody will be able to judge if the EU internal market is delivering to citizens or not. That sounds good. Enrico Letta. I'm sorry because I, have to, I want to change completely this course on that. My big fear is that we will vote next European Parliament and in reality the only true political debate will be on national issues in political terms, not on European issues. In Germany, you will have a debate not on where German, when Europe goes, but is the national government will be, is the national government strengthened or not by the European Parliament? In Italy, it will be the same. In France, the debate will be on Macron, and so on and so forth. That is a disaster, because it is a step back And it is a way to say, citizens, you think that the European Union is a non-democratic building, and you're right, because we vote, and at the end of the day, your vote doesn't count anything, because the debate is only at national level. So it's a sort of poll for the national um, domestic situation. So we are approaching the European elections without any change in this uh, topic. And frankly speaking, I'm really afraid that we are having, a, again, European elections with this mood. And that will be, um, in my view, a big, big, uh, I would say, problem for the next legislature, a problem of legitimacy for the next legislature. And the next legislature is decisive for the Green Deal, for the future of our uh, children, for the future of our planet. And if you are not able to give legitimacy to the next leadership at European level, we will be always with the idea that at the end of the day is member states and everything is the internal debate of member states. And I have to say that it's, it's an enormous mistake, and I, will, I want to fight on that. Is the European Parliament prepared for fighting on that? And will there be some kind of campaign also cross-party from, from the European Parliament on, on looking at these European election topics rather than uh, nationalizing the European elections? 
Um, I think um, from those who were already for a long time in European affairs, we often have, unfortunately, the effect that you have um, basically a call on, on the national government instead of true European elections. But I think also the past shows that if there are really concrete topics um, that mobilize people, this can change. Last time when I was running, um, there was this um, whole, for some people it's probably a little bit weird, but there was this whole debate on the article, what was it, 17 or 13 of the copyright and, you know, all the young people were on the streets and they were like, okay, now we vote for the left wing because the right wing is destroying the internet. So there is like, you know, sometimes you can really mobilize with very, very concrete topics or campaigns that you can probably not steer. It also depends a little bit that they're in, in, the, in the public debate. Um, I think what is also really, really important to do is to exactly show to citizens that, yes, your vote is counting and every vote is counting. Um, we had so many tight votes this term in the European Parliament where we either by one or two votes, you know, won the nature restoration law or lost the pesticide law or whatever. So I think this is one of the main messages that at the end it makes such a difference uh, if you vote or not or what do you vote. Um, and explaining this all the time to citizens, I think this is the main part of the parties who are now campaigning. I think for us here, uh, we will be certainly advocating for that. And uh, also the, the foundation will do a lot of events on highlighting these concrete topics. Uh, and for those who would like to uh, dive into the vision uh, for the single market, uh, there's also a study issued by our uh, Brussels uh, office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, on 30 years of the EU single mar market, new visions for a green Europe. Uh, you will find it here in print on, uh, and also online. So uh, get also into it and, and get engaged in making clear that these ne next elections are key for the future of the single market. And that means for the future of all of us in Europe. Thank you very much, Enrico Letter. Thank you very much, Francisca and Anna, for being here.